to the o, uh, the Oklahoma City bombings uh, have also had connections to uh, FBI, ATF, what have you, and and so it, 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 it it's 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 extremely suspicious because you have both you have you have radical uh, radicals which uh, uh, are uh, radical uh, Chicano uh, organizations which uh, have been largely financed by. Uh, uh, tax exempt foundations like the Ford Foundation, and then you have uh, uh, white supremacist uh, uh, enclaves which uh, have uh, ties into uh, uh, the federal uh, federal law enforcement agencies and what have you. It seems to suggest that this that this racial dialectic is being promulgated from above by the uh, ruling class elite for the purposes again of of fomenting a uh, socially and politically expedient race war. Uh, if you're just joining us, we're talking with um, Philip and Paul Collins. They have co-authored an article entitled The Ruling Class Sponsored Race War and the Balkanization of America. And uh, we're coming to you from uh, Boulder City, Nevada through Remnant Radio. Uh, we thank Paul Pilgrim. And we're, uh, if we're having some little audio problems, uh, Paul's trying to do the best he can to tell me on my end how I might remedy that, so stay with us if, in fact, it's a little bit uh, harsh or grating. Um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll work that out. Um, uh, guys, I, you know, I, I have to tell you, um, I, I think this is a planned situation without a doubt, the fact that it is, and I don't even think you're really arguing that. But let's talk about some of the personages that are involved in, I guess, the counter-immigration movement. Um, to involve groups that I don't think many people have heard of, for instance, uh, such as the Council of Conservative Citizens and Numbers USA. Do uh, you want to top off with that and, and tell us what that's about? Sure, sure. Okay, well, well, like I said, Michael wanted us to look into this situation, Michael Corbin, who uh, has the uh, Colorado-based uh, A Closer Lick radio show. And so we started with uh, the character of Glenn Spencer, who, had, who Michael had called and tried to alert uh, to the fact that, that Alex Linder and Kevin McDonald had been on this video, A Line in the Sand. And uh, Spencer basically told Michael that he had no problems and no qualms with the fact that, that, uh, that these two had been on the same video as Minutemen. And all. although Michael found this quite disturbing because you, of course, ha have the whole thing of the, 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 the chance for guilt by association and the, the chance that that people, you know, out there on the left would lump uh, the Minutemen in with uh, white supremacists. So we started with Glenn Spencer, and we looked into Glenn Spencer's background, and we found that uh, Spencer's American Border Patrol, which is not to be uh, mistaken with the U.S. Border Patrol, it's, it's not the official United States Border Patrol, had uh, been funded uh, by... John, uh, by an individual named John Canton by his organizations since 1992. And uh, we found out that Spencer was a keynote speaker in uh, 2002 at, a, at the fifth biennial American Renaissance Conference titled In Defense of the Western Man. And uh, American Renaissance is basically an umbrella organization for a wide variety of of different uh, white supremacist and white nationalist groups. Mark Weber was at this conference. Uh, he was uh, a member of the Institute for Historical Review, which is a Holocaust-denying uh, organization. They, they either deny that the Holocaust happened or they deny that the numbers were as large as they were. Uh, and also at this conference, we found, uh, curiously enough, that Glenn Spencer said a second Mexican-American war would break out in 2003, as if he was trying to incite such a thing. And uh, we also found out that Tanton's group, uh, Numbers USA, had two staff members that claimed to work out of the office of, of uh, Denver, uh, I mean, of, out of um, the Colorado representative Tom Tancredo's office, um, Rosemary Jenks and Linda Pardue, who were lobbyists of Numbers USA. And uh, this was uh, extremely uh, disturbing, given uh, Dan Credo's uh, being part of uh, chair of the um, Congressional Immigration uh, Reform Caucus. So it was all leading back to this individual, John Tanton, and his uh, whole uh, funding arm. 
and it was just a vast array of, of groups that this one man had put together. And I'll turn it over to Phil to give his uh, resume over Tanton. Yeah, Tanton, Tanton essentially uh, has has formed a vast uh, loose net, net uh, loose net network of uh, groups. Uh, uh, he uh, formed the American Immigration Control Foundation. He formed the American Patrol voice of citizens together he formed california coalition for immigration reform uh, uh it goes on and on some of the most significant of the groups though is uh, uh uh numbers usa and the social contract press and uh anybody who goes to uh the social contract press's website they'll find that the organization concerns it concerns itself with and i'm quoting them now straight from their website quote population size and rate of growth, protection of the environment and precious resources, limits on immigration, as well as preservation and promotion of a shared American language and culture, unquote. Now, the, the web links on the website are uh, include caring capacity network, negative population growth, population and sustainability. Now, if you're not, uh, 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 those who are are astute enough to pick up on the thematic continuity underpinning these web links, you'll notice that they're all linked to population control organizations. And this comes as a little surprise because Tanton chaired the uh, National Sierra Club's Population Committee from uh, uh, 1971 to 1974. He was also on the National Board of Zero Population Growth, ZPG, from 1973 to 1978 and included the term a president as, uh, from uh, 1975 to 1977. And those who are, are, aren't familiar with uh, zero population growth, it, this organization was formed by a man by the name of Paul Ehrlich, who wrote uh, in the, during the 70s a book called The Population Bomb. And this book uh, presented all sorts of uh, phony baloney, apocalyptic scenarios, and eschatological claims that uh, the 70s would witness uh, a mass ecological collapse of the planet, that mass starvation and uh, 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 disasters were on the way as a result of uh, uh, uncontrolled human population growth. Also, Paul Ehrlich's wife is a member of none other than the Club of Rome. And the Club of Rome is one of the many elite machinations that's responsible for promulgating uh, 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 hypothetical scenarios concerning overpopulation and environmental degradation. And uh, one of one of its uh, one of its uh, reports, the first global revolution, uh, it says. And now I'm quoting it directly. Quote: In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine, and the like would fit the, the bill. But in designating them as the en enemy, we fall into the trap of mi mistaking symptoms for causes. All these dangers are caused by human intervention, and it is only through changed attitudes and behavior that they can be overcome. The real enemy, then, is humanity itself, unquote. And thus, this, this uh, machination of the, of the elite, the Club of Rome, circulates its literature and its propaganda in hopes of, of uh, uh, making us believe that we, the human race, are the ultimate enemy. And in order to, to keep the human race uh, in check, we're going to have to have some uh, on, omnipotent, mm -hmm. uh, 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 omnipotent, monolithic, uh, supranational entity with unlimited powers to keep the nemesis of humanity in check and to retard its environmentally unsound industrial and technological development. Uh, and of course, this, 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 their, all their, their solutions uh, go back to uh, world government, go uh -huh. up to a, a new world order, and what have you. And th these are the type of people that John Tanton is associated with. Well, let me, uh, let me stop you right there if I could, because you bit off a lot there, and I'd just like to address that. Without a doubt, Ehrlich is a piece of garbage. Yeah. And um, very much a proponent of not only population control, but that lovely word, depopulation. Absolutely. Now, Interestingly, as you just said also, the Club of Rome has always fully been behind this since the 60s. And one of their charter members, the late Aurelio Pecci, wrote the book, The Chasm Ahead, in which he quotes J.D. Bernal in stating that if uh, population isn't stemmed, 
there's going to have to be a couple of uh, very draconian uh, solutions, and that is basically shifting populations, you know, treating them like chattel and sending them someplace where they don't want to go, or um, actually uh, extermination, or that something will be loosed in the society um, that will cull the population. I mean, not even a chance that this person is thinking of any other way out. These characters were are just really ready to pull the lever to say we're in trouble, so let's um, basically just gas or whatever, uh, you know, a couple of billion people. But now, uh, and I'm glad you brought that up because people should be alert to Ehrlich especially, and his, his, in, his books and literature to this day um, are, are uh, salient um, instruments in uh, sociology and environmental uh, departments in uh, colleges across the United States, which tells you where they're at. That's but, right. But now, um, where is this connectivity between this obvious elitist um, depopulation head uh, with those who are involved in what's going on now with the uh, immigration problem? In other words, are you saying that that mentality is sifted into those who would like to stem illegal immigration? Well, essentially, yes. Those, that's the, the motive. The motive behind that, that are underpinning Tanton and his uh, his uh, financing of, of several uh, uh, immigration reform organizations. Uh, Tanton's, Tanton's uh, anti-immigration racism synchronizes very comfortably with neo-Malthusianism. Neo-Malthusians harbor no small amount of disdain for pro-fertility belief systems. Needless to say, Hispanic immigrants come from predominantly Catholic countries. And of course, Catholicism is a pro-fertility belief system. Neo-Malthusians contend that uh, pro-fertility adherents will have more children, which it will, in turn, ensure the continuity of a pro-fertility tradition in future generations. The Neo-Malthusian believes that this continuing selection for pro-fertility is analogous to the continuing evolutionary selection for beneficial genes. And immediately the eugenical character of Neo-Malthusianism becomes evident. Uh, at any rate, Neo-Malthusianism, uh, or Neo-Malthusian, believe that increased fertility will result in what they call hyper-exponential population growth. Now, while immigrants can contribute to economic production, Neo-Malthusians argue that economic production will experience little or no increase, and inevitably economic production will be outstripped by the burgeoning fertility of the population, and this leads to what they call a Malthusian check, where subsistence levels are stabilized, but only after mass starvation and death. This is the bizarre eschatology to which Neo-Malthusians, like John Tanton, adhere, it's a very, it, and it's very cozy with the with anti-immigration uh, racism and what what is this extremely troubling is the fact that john tanton a man who adheres to such uh, uh, uh such ideologies which obviously obviously have been diffused uh uh throughout the population by the ruling class and uh, uh, basically find their origins with the ruling class particularly ruling class think tanks like the club of rome and what have you uh, 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 is that his 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 loosely knit org, uh, organizational octopus is beginning to subsume uh, legit uh, legitimate immigration reform organizations like the Minutemen, and that 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 now he begin he he is beginning to turn and shift uh, the the attention away from legitimate immigration reform to essentially a population control agenda. That's disguised as immigration reform. I, I think it's also worth mentioning that uh, John Tanton was the former president of the Northern Michigan uh, branch of Planned Parenthood. And for those who are not familiar with Planned Parenthood's track record, Planned Parenthood was founded by Mar Margaret Singer. Margaret Singer was an out and out racist. She uh, ha hated uh, black people. She hated Native Americans. She hated Jews. She called them uh, retrograde races, uh, human weeds. Those are her own words. Margaret Singer uh, uh, published the uh, birth control review. Uh, uh, birth, yeah, birth control review. And uh, in birth control review, uh, she had several uh, uh, eugenics uh, 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 eugenics scientists write 
uh, articles for that magazine, and one of them was none other than Dr. Ernest Rudin, who was uh, Hitler's director of genetic sterilization and a founder of the Nazi Society for uh, Racial Hygiene. Uh, Margaret Singer also uh, uh, proposed several racist policies, such as uh, compulsory sterilization. And, and does it does it come as little surprise that compulsory sterilization and 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 segregation of certain segments of the population are exactly the very same things that uh, people like Paul Ehrlich were suggesting? Uh, this, this 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 eugenical uh, uh, tradition is is closely closely knit in with the zero population growth uh, uh, crowd. Uh, she also uh, uh, proposed a, uh, a gulag system throughout the United States <laughs> to which uh, uh, most of the population would be uh, relegated. Only 13.5% of the population would be allowed to reproduce. Um, and essentially, this is, this, this is the, uh, the uh, overall heritage towards uh, uh, towards which uh, uh, Planned Parenthood lays claim and is part of uh, John Tanton's heritage as well. Um, uh, let me ask you how you feel about this. Um, take this for what it's worth. I think it's a decent representation of what's going on in the southeast and the southwest part of the United States. Now, Lady Viz and I go skating about every week and, and um, you know, we think dual income, no kids, right? And we go up to the track, and invariably there'll be some Latino families come up, and they come up with no less than two or three kids and one in the oven. And I, you know, I'm looking at this and saying, you know, is somebody not getting the message? In other words, and I'll be honest with you. I mean, you know, my fear is if it's going to hit the fan, uh, whites basically are, on, you know, below zero uh, population or, or replacement growth, and we're looking at Latinos. Last time I looked, they were on the top of uh, the ten nations, uh, when we're talking about Mexico in particular, um, that are uh, reproducing. It's like, is somebody not getting a message here? How do you feel about that? Well, actually, uh, see, the thing is, though, is that the, the, pro the problem is when we start to complain about how many children the, the people of, of a different colors are having, we start to make this slide into, uh, into uh, eugenics. And, and into and into talking about uh, talking about the, the what we consider to be un, unthinkable and unworkable policies, and it starts to fall into the trajectory that that Tanton uh, uh, of, of, it starts to fall into Tanton's uh, tra trajectory, and and uh, once again when you head in uh, head into the realm of of, of Tanton, uh, you're heading into the realm of elite think tanks such as the Club of Rome. Which uh, was headed up by Aurelio Pacheki, uh, you know, who was a who was a Freemason and who was basically an, uh, an elitist, and 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 um, it, you're you're just you're starting to get off into the the, the elite's way of 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 thinking, and when when you begin to uh, you know when you begin to you know think of 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 other people. Uh, of different color, uh, you know, basically d doing what what uh, what whites are doing too, uh, starting families and whatnot. And uh, essentially, essentially, the the, pro the problem is is that that national identity, uh, uh, and, and this seems to be a problem throughout the so-called uh, patriot movement. Uh, 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 national identity, is, for some reason, is being equated with race. And that confuses the real issue at hand. National identity, uh, the precepts of Americanism, have nothing to do with race. It's not a racial criteria. It, 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 it's, it's purely based on ideas, the ideas of human liberty and human dignity. And those basically pre, those, those preclude uh, 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 those preclude, preclude any racial considerations. Uh, if if the instant that a person begins to think along those lines, they're thinking along the same lines of John Ruskin and his race, race patriotism. And as we all know, John Ruskin's race patriotism was precisely one of the motivating uh, factors that, that led to uh, uh, Cecil Rhodes' uh, erection of uh, Pax Britannia, uh, the consolidation of the diamond mines in uh, mm -hmm. Africa, and, uh, of course, out of Cecil Rhodes' uh, camp. Uh, from the roundtable groups, you would eventually have uh, the Council on Foreign Relations and 
Trilateral Commission here in the United States, which are the ones beginning the problem, uh, who are causing all the problems here to begin with. So ultimately, the, pro the problem is not that, that uh, immigration levels are being debated. It, the problem is, is that people are trying to, uh, first off, people are trying to apply uh, a racial criteria to it. Uh, it, which has very little to, uh, which has very little to do with the issue. The issue is whether or not the people coming here wish to share in the precepts and the fruits of Americanism. Well, uh, I'll tell you straight out, they don't. Now, hear me out. Uh, sure. This illegal immigration, and you guys touch upon it, and I thought of it in a very negative sense, as, uh, instead of looking at the work as stating fact and a work of fiction, that's the camp of the saints. Uh, it is foretold that Western Anglo nations will be um, inundated with third worlders to change the whole cultural and uh, uh, national landscape of the country. This to cause friction deliberately. Now, understand me. Understand this. Uh, do I un do I understand that people want to come to this country for a better life? Of course I do, but they're being used as we're being used and I'll tell you uh, you know straight off guys the Vatican is behind the second invasion of Roman Catholics the first being prior to world uh, to the Civil War to get ready to kick the Protestant southern states butt. now I'm looking at what's taking place here I understand why they're here I can't blame them and they're being used but needless to say I will tell you straight out that the immigrants that are coming in in the last number of years are openly hostile to Anglos. This is the United States. We speak English. And if you don't want to do that, then pack up. My point is, we're becoming such sissies about multicultural diversity and all this crap that we bend ourselves to whatever comes in instead of saying, if you want to live here, this is what we do. Now, I'm not saying you guys are anti that. Okay, I'm not going to put you well, on that well, side but of the fence. We have, to, we have to be very careful where we head in this. I mean, like, we're, we're for English as being the national language, too, but that's for logistical purposes. That's so that you have a degree of social cohesion because you will have no social cohesion if you have people speaking five and six different languages. It, what you'll have then is social fragmentation. But we don't, we don't promote uh, English as being the predominant language because because the English people are superior to other people. It's simply a matter of logistics and all. And, and we're, we're very careful when it comes to books such as The Camp of the Saints because Tanton was influenced by that book. And uh, it, it just seemed to me that the whole idea of the White West being invaded by dark-skinned foreigners, as the book uh, presents, is, is, is supposed to uh, frighten people and scare people of, uh, that, that are white into uh, into having a very adversarial uh, uh, approach when it comes to people of of other colors. Once once again, this is about a dialectic being set up. This is about uh, whites being radicalized into white supremacy, and then uh, Ch Chicanos or or uh, or the Hispanics or people from other countries being radicalized into whatever their racial equivalent of, of supremacy uh, doctrine is as well and then being pitted against one another. Well, would you agree that this immigration is, is planned to have a fragmentating um, effect? I think that right now the, the way that it is, the way that the policy is set up is that it is. It is. It's, it's, it's supposed to uh, be divisive. It's supposed to inject what is known as tribal politics into the population. And, uh, and but but uh, it can be fixed and it can be reformed. It can be made so that that uh, people uh, that come over here legally and 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 are are screened and careful and 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 those who uh, who do not want to uh, sh share in the tradition of Americanism, who do not want to adhere to the Constitution, to the Bill of Rights, the, and, and to the precepts set down by the founding fathers those individuals are screened out I, I want to remind everybody you're listening to the grassy knoll uh, we're coming to you from remnant radio out in boulder city nevada and we have with us philip and paul collins um authors and uh, very prolific writers uh you can go to my website if that's the fastest way you can do it uh and click on conspiracyarchives.com 
there is a commentary section uh, dedicated just to the Collins' work. And as you guys know out there, our listeners, that is, um, they've been with us uh, a number of times and also for a 10-part series called The Magicians of Mutability. Uh, if I've left anything out at this time, folks, um, can you tell us um, uh, more about perhaps where people can find out about your work and actually buy it? Uh, sure. Uh, well, they can uh, basically find it at uh, Amazon.com, BarnesNobles.com. It's also available through uh, iUniverse.com, all one word, or AuthorHouse, all one word, dot com. And uh, the newest article that we wrote, uh, the ruling class sponsored race war and the balkanization of America, will be available uh, in the uh, upcoming issue of the ACL report. That's uh, available at www. For the number four, a cultural look dot com. Um. I, I always like Eric John Phelps when he uh, de defines himself. And I'll throw this out at you because I'll tell you, somebody called me a racist for saying this. When I described myself as a white Baptist freeman, they told me I was racist. And I said, well, what of those descriptors is inaccurate? My point being is that, and I'm not saying you guys are going there, so uh, again, I'm not putting you on the other side of the argument. But what I am saying is that if you were to be able to speak freely about your whiteness with no detrimental remarks about anyone else, I like being white. Uh, the knee-jerk reaction these days to the brainwashing is that you're a racist. How do you feel about that? Well, I have to uh, agree with you on that in the respect that a uh, that a, that a, uh, a black person can definitely get up and talk about uh, the different about Huey Newton and about. Uh, Shirley Chisholm or, you know, or Frederick Douglass or, or somebody, you know, w w whether it be moderate blacks or radical blacks and, and celebrate uh, those individuals and their background and, and whatnot. And uh, whites, you know, when whites do that, it's, there does seem to be kind of like, a, you know, this, this double standard mm -hmm. and all. Uh, well, what we ultimately want to work towards is, is just, just, a colorblind kind of uh, society, where where an individual's merit is not whether it, when, for instance, if you look at George Washington and look at uh, you know the, the the wonderful things about him, uh, the first thing that's the, that's brought up is is his merit and his his whiteness doesn't even become uh, become an issue. Uh, likewise with somebody like Frederick Douglass and, and uh, you know what what he was uh, what he was all about uh, his blackness taking a back seat to his merits you know or, or Booker T Washington his blackness taking a back seat to his merits and uh, you know basically making uh, making things colorblind because uh, as long as as long as we are painfully aware of the fact that we are all different colors. Uh, and and as long as we make an issue out of it, uh, the elites are going to be able to play it up as something, and then are going to be able to use the issue to their to their advantage. And uh, I, and in a few minutes, I'd like to uh, get into the different elites that are behind John Tanton, and uh, the, the, because you'd be surprised some of the names that come up and and what trajectories we, we fall into there because we fall into the exact same trajectories that that, uh, that many uh, people that would describe themselves as patriots uh, would, would, would find disturbing. Go for it. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, well, I... Canton uh, has also received uh, money from the Scaife family. The Scaifes are heirs to the uh, Mellon Bank fortune. Uh, the Scaifes Foundation has, gave $1.4 million to uh, the Federation for American Immigration Reform, which is one of Tanton's organizations, between uh, 1986 and uh, 2000. Now, when you look into Richard Mellon Scaifes' background, uh, he's the head of the dynasty ba basically right now, you, you find something interesting. You find this this background that's just steeped in in the intelligence community. His father, Alan Scaife, was a lieutenant colonel in the OSS. The OSS uh, was the uh, forerunner to uh, CIA. 
then uh, Paul Millen, the uh, cousin of Scaife's mother, was a major in the OSS that worked under Ellen Dulles. And then uh, David Bruce, who was Paul Millen's brother-in-law, was a member of the OSS and oversaw all the OSS's operations in Europe and was given that position by the OSS head, uh, William Wild Bill Donovan. And then uh, David Bruce's second wife, Evangeline, was an OSS uh, secretary. And then another one of the uh, Mellon Scaife clan, uh, Larimer Mellon, was, was a member of the OSS as well. And uh, this is, and so, so you have this background steeped in the intelligence community, and it, it's, and it looks like Richard Mellon Scaife himself was involved in the intelligence community because he headed uh, Forum World Features, which was a publishing organ, which was publicly named as a CIA front, and of course the Central Intelligence Agency was for was was the uh, was was basically the, uh, the what, what came after the OSS was was the child of the OSS uh, and whatnot and um, it's it's po- it's probable that that uh, um, Richard Mellon Scaife learned the trick of using philanthropy uh, as a cover for funding intelligence projects uh, from his from his intelligence background. Uh, that that's one of the tricks that he learned from 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 all this uh, background in, in intelligence, and that the uh, the Tanton network is one such intelligence project. Then you also have another organization which was involved with the uh, with with the Tanton uh, network and had given money to the Tanton network, which is the uh, the Smith Richardson Foundation. And uh, the Smith Richardson Foundation has also given money to none other than the Council on Foreign Relations, which is this country's foreign policy cartel and is a real, you know, concern for those who are patriots. They've given about $883,073 to to the um, Council on Foreign Relations. And when you also look at the uh, Smith Richardson Foundation, you find out that they have connections to the U.S. intelligence community as well. Um, the, 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 um, when it was known merely as the Richardson Foundation, uh, this foundation helped finance uh, experiments at Bridgewater Hospital in Massachusetts. Uh, these experiments were the MK Ultra experiments, the infamous. Uh, Central Intelligence Agency project into mind control. Uh, the Smith Richardson uh, Foundation also has what is called the Center for Creative Leadership, and uh, this Center for Creative Re- Leadership uh, basically trains agents of the Central Intelligence Agency and uh, basically uh, puts them through this grueling kind of kind of mind to- uh, mind test, like a psychodrama. Of sorts, and, and trains them in uh, in that. And uh, they have the the Center for Creative Leadership also has an, another office in Langley, Virginia, at the headquarters of the Central Intelligence Agency. And we also, when we look at the Smith Richardson Foundation, you find uh, the Bush family was involved with it because the the Bushes knew Richardson uh, through uh, Sears Roebuck's chairman, General Robert E. Wood. Uh, who headed up uh, America First organization, which had been against war with Hitler's Germany and had equated uh, fighting uh, fighting Hitler with basically joining the communists. Which there's a, there's a different there's a there's a difference to be drawn there. Uh, and also Richardson's wife was a relative of Nancy Langhorn, who had married Lord Ash, uh, Astor, and as many of your listeners may know, Astor had uh, been a supporter of the Nazi, of the Nazis and uh, also uh, Smith and Richardson was organized by Eugene Stetson Jr. who was Richardson's son-in-law and Stetson was a member of the Skull and Bones he was initiate, an initiate from 1934 and had worked for uh, Prescott Bush as assistant manager of the uh, New York branch of Brown's, Brown Brothers Harriman and so you have these uh, curious intelligence and elite groups uh, behind the Tanton network, which is getting 
pointed fingers into the uh, Minutemen, and and you can see where they're trying to uh, subsume the the minute where where these elites might be trying to subs uh, trying to take the uh, Minutemen over and manipulate them for their purposes. Um, one more thing I might add is that if you also look into Richard Mellonscape's background. You see that he also gave money to the uh, project for the New American Century, which is the uh, which is the whole neoconservative um, uh, group project for for basically world, what, what would be nothing less than world dominion, world government, with uh, with a, an American empire as a stepping stone. So we're falling now into the trajectory of the neoconservatives. We're falling into the uh, trajectory of the Scaife dynasty, uh, the Smith and Richardson, uh, the Richardson um, dynasty, which was built on the Vicks vapor rub fortune, and uh, and into uh, also the, the some darker elements of the uh, Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, this is the Grassy Knoll. Um, this is Viz speaking with uh, the Collins brothers, uh, Paul and Philip. Um, and um, Paul Pilgrim out there in Nevada, <clears throat> I don't know if you're ready to spin a little music uh, in anticipation of, of a couple of minute break. Uh, if it's okay with you guys, uh, Paul Collins and Phil Collins, sure, uh, sure. we can do that and we'll just come back, you know, three to five minutes or whatever. But um, I want to let everybody know also that uh, you can contact us. You can ask a question, uh, make a comment through either the email to me at visigoth at hotmail.com. That's V-Y-Z-Y-G-O-T-H at hotmail.com. You can instant message at AOL, this address, that's WDCF 1350. And if you want to spend a dime and you guys know what the situation is, I'm sorry, but we've lost our 800 numbers, you can call in on uh, 352 567 one zero zero nine, and I will tell uh, some of the uh, people out there whom I trust that if you want to email me and you want to call on my dime, um, I do have a calling card that I will give you for that purpose. So remember that. So you can email at visigoth at hotmail dot com. You can AOL instant message at WDCF thirteen fifty, and you can also give us a ring. And uh, Paul, if you're out there. Um, do you want to give us a little uh, music interlude? <laughs> uh, do you, uh, Philip and Paul, do you hear that? Yeah, yeah, I hear that. Okay, you probably hear it better than I. Um, so yeah. listen, um, I'll be back in a couple of minutes, and we'll pick it up on the other side. Okay, got gotcha. you. Is you there? I'm here. All right, go on, brother. We're all set to go. That was the music? That was it. <laughs> and, you know, if you couldn't inflame the situation anymore, what music, what, what tune does he choose but <laughs> Dixie Land? <laughs> what a sense of humor. Uh, we're with um, <laughs> Paul and Philip Collins. This is the Grassy Knoll coming to you from Boulder City, Nevada, uh, courtesy of Remnant Radio. And um, we're discussing the latest piece by the Collins Brothers. And that title is The Ruling Class Sponsored Race War and the Balkanization of America. And um, I just want to let everybody know once again, if you want to uh, chime in on this discussion, you can do so by emailing at Vizigoth, B-Y-Z-Y-G-O-T-H, at Hotmail.com. Also, you can uh, A-O-L-I-M at W-D-C-F-1350, or you can call at 352-567-1009 and that's good uh, obviously uh, uh, for out of, out of the uh, local area or in the local area if you're here and uh, you want to uh, uh, chime in on this thing um, fellas I'm going to play if it's okay with you one cut okay Okay. I hope it goes alright Paul um, um, I'm going to play it out of the CD here and I would assume it would be okay that you guys will hear it fine and I'll, I'll come back with a comment that's going to surprise you okay, okay sure. right, so here we go let's roll it but there's only one nigger on the planet. And the nigger that's on the planet is the one that is destroying the water, the one that's polluting the air, the one that is exploiting people and resources. And the only nigger on the planet is the white man and the white woman. And then our people are not niggers. We are imitation niggers. 
And the one idea is how we are going to exterminate white people. Because that, in my estimation, is the only conclusion I have come to. We have to exterminate white people off of the face of the planet to solve this problem. That we need to solve this problem because they are going to kill us. And I will leave on that. So we have to just set up our own system and stop playing and get very serious and not be diverted from coming up with a solution to the problem. And the problem on the planet is white people. Now, that was on C-SPAN. Have you guys seen or heard that? I have heard that. Yes, I have. Um, this individual, I can't remember his name. He's, he was a university uh, professor, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> No, no, now you're probably thinking I'm going to get all inflamed about that. But let me say this. Do I like that rhetoric? No. Do I think that that person should be arrested? No. Do I think that there should be a hate crime level against him? No. I just want to say one thing. I, I have to say he exercises First Amendment rights, and I'm okay with that. But let me say anything like that. And you know where my butt will be for the next 15 years? And that's my point. There's a double standard here. And it's not okay when, when a white person says, you know what, there's a double standard and we're getting the short end of it. So, I mean, my point, you know, all this stuff about, you know, sensitivity and hurting people's feelings is all about basically just getting rid of the First Amendment. And we think we all know that. So what I'm saying is he has the right to say that, and I'm okay with that. But, I mean, if I were to say, you know, gee, I, you know, I like a white student union, oh, man, what would happen there? So, anyway, good. Yeah. Sure, uh, and essentially, you know, uh, uh, basically, the political correctness uh, and nonsense like that equates to a little more than intellectual totalitarianism. Uh, uh, and and it, it, moreover, it, it does not solve the problem. It does not solve the problem. It does not. It it it, it, it mm -hmm. does it does it doesn't basically. It, it's a lot like it's a lot like communism. Communism comes along purporting to in class distinctions and all that communism does is set up brand new class distinctions likewise uh, uh political correctness and multi the multiculturalism come along purporting to end racism and all that they do is they promote a brand new variety of racism and that 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 that's part of the problem the problem is though you know is 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 the fact that there's a racial criteria for anything at all and that that's one of that's one of my major uh, uh, one of my major gripes is is the fact that people are, seem to think that national identity is the, it, 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 they equate it with race and that confuses the issue. National identity has nothing to do with race. Any uh, uh, anybody who believes in the Constitution and believes in the Bill of Rights believes in the tenets of Americanism is an American. I don't care what color they are. I don't care if they're they're green. Uh, uh, that that is what makes them Amer uh, an American, and that that's part of the problem. Is that's one of the reasons that that segments of the population are so easily radicalized by the power elite is because is because they think along racial lines. And uh, you know, as as you and I both know, uh, Jesus uh, when Jesus uh, uh, came to this planet and and uh, was teaching uh, uh, teaching us. The ways of the Lord. Uh, Jesus gave the sermon of the uh, 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 the Good Samaritan, the par yeah, the, the parable uh, of the Good Samaritan. And in that parable, uh, basically, the good guy, the he the hero, turned out being a Samaritan. The, the, he, he's the one who who helps the, who helps the uh, 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 Jew who has been battered and beaten by thieves. Well, you come to find out that at the time, Samaritan were not were not very highly regarded by the Jews, and likewise, Jews were not very highly regarded by the Samaritans. The race there was a great deal of racial discord between the two. Jesus's point was was that the fact that that, that this man was a Samaritan was inconsequential. He did the right thing. He did what what the Lord would have had them do. And likewise, that's what we need to do. And and when when you have some radical coming along saying kill all the, the white people, and, and you have some 
uh, back hill Bubba coming along saying kill all the black people. All that is 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 making it easier for the the power elite to manipulate us. And again, uh, what 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 we advocate, we're not we do not believe in you know political correctness. We do not believe in multiculturalism. What we advocate though is a non-racial criteria, a non-racial approach to the problem, because otherwise that confuses the issue at hand, and the issues at hand are national sovereignty and border integrity. Oh, yeah, and, and you know, not that I care much for uh, Michael Savage anymore, but I believe he kind of coined it when he said, you know, you're in trouble when you lose your border, your culture, and your language. And I think we're seeing that happen without a doubt. And that can only happen if it's deliberately allowed to happen, because, as I said, you know, we... We've had a border patrol. We've been able to control it for how many, uh, you know, actually centuries. Uh, and I remember in my little escapades going across uh, uh, into Mexico, you know, I couldn't cross back one way or the other without, without the border patrol getting on whatever bus I might have been on or whatever. Now, the yeah. fact that that can't happen anymore, um, that, you know, that they're crossing the border like a bunch of broken oranges coming out of a bag is, like, astounding to me. And, of course, it's one of the most ill-reputed stories by the media and yet, you take a look at our president, um, president, who obviously, you know, w would endear himself to the Latino vote. And if they ever drop the term limitations, he could probably rule forever. And the same with his brother Jeb over here in Florida. Um, as I said, I, you know, I believe that this is deliberate. Uh, I believe that it is. I will say this, and you don't have to jump in there, but if you want to address it, you can. And that is, the Vatican has always hated the United States because it was an extension of Protestantism and the revolt from the Catholic Church. And they were successful. Uh, I'm not saying everybody in the uh, Founding Fathers was Christian. I know they weren't. But the thing was, still and all, they made it happen. And, um, and I believe to this day that the Vatican has, has ordered this immigration from Latino nations, which are basically Roman Catholic, to propagate as much as they can to basically throw off the whole demographics of the United States. And guys, I understand what you're saying. Look. Sure. Sure. We're all, we're, they, are, they are definitely agitating, and I'm talking about the Vatican. But you see, I also have to tell you more so than what you feel in Ohio. I'm, I'm down here in Florida, and I am telling you um, <laughs> that, that there is a palpable hatred toward me. Now, here's my problem. Even though I know they're getting used, and even though I know they want a better life, if they're going to hold a damn knife to my throat, I can't really worry about what the situation is. And so I have a little dilemma here. One, I want to be peaceable, but two, I got to tell you, I have to prepare for the worst. And so that's, that's the line I walk here. And, um, you know, so I look at the Minutemen probably not as harshly as you guys do. And in your conclusion in that story, you say you want them to absolutely um, evacuate any racist element there. And I would tell you, I would agree with you, but you can't guarantee that. And nor could you guarantee that with the uh, immigrants who feel as pitched against us. So, in other words, you're never going to get a vanilla, um, poly purebred Minuteman group, but you can keep that in check and, and not have that pernicious element take it over. But I think you drew too harsh um, a benchmark for the Minutemen. And by all means, please respond. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that unless we have periodic cleaning of our own house, periodic house cleaning, then we'll be subverted. And that's just the way that, it's, that, it, that it is. And, uh, in this case, the, the problem is, is that what's, what's supposed to be a grassroots movement has not been kept grassroots. You know, we have the Diener group coming in, which is, which is a, a thoroughly neoconservative group. Uh, and giving giving uh, money over uh, and well, t taking over and, and funding uh, the Minutemen cause and uh, Joe McCutcheon, who is a is a illegal immigration, uh, uh, ad, uh, well he he's 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 against it. He's a he's a border activist. Uh, was on the uh, show with, that I did with Michael Corbin and and pointed out that the Diener group actually has had the uh, the names of the members of the Minutemen turned over to them. We have people like Richard Mellon Scaife, who is no friend, uh, who is an elite, and who is no friend to the common person, uh, giving money to uh, to Tanton, and thus, you know, having an influence over the uh, Minutemen by proxy. And also the Smith-Richardson the Smith group, 
you know, giving money to Tanton and thus, you know, controlling the uh, the, the Minutemen by proxy and and making sure that all these uh, that these racist ideas get injected into a group that into this group and thus creating a a, a cultural milieu of neo tribalism and and whatnot. And and so so it's not it's no longer a gra- it's it's. It's, it's, it's fighting to remain, but it's, it won't remain too long a grassroots effort and grassroots movement if, if you have those elite influences there and, and whatnot. And, so, and, and if you want your activism to be effective, then, then it must remain grassroots. And, and unfortunately, that's not what's taking place here with the, with the Minutemen. We see these, these elites and these, uh, these uh, forces that 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 w- could be described as oligarchical uh, the, in the whole mix, uh, starting to uh, subvert things. Yeah. And, and and also, uh, uh, in, mm-hmm. in regards to being, uh, I guess you you consider uh, our, our our overall uh, assessment of them as somewhat harsh. Um, I, I wouldn't so much say that that I'm, I'm, we're trying to be harsh, but. The simple fact of the matter is, is that if we want to remain the good guys, we got to keep ourselves cleaner and, and, and you know just cleaner and, and uh, a, a lot a lot neater than, than you know uh, we, we can't afford to really we can't afford to really have these sh- sort of shortcomings and you know against uh, a, a biblical you know example uh, uh, whenever whenever one of the uh, uh, early uh, uh, Whenever one of the branches of the early church started to fall away, uh, for instance, you look in the book of Galatians, when uh, Paul wrote to them, uh, I, I guess the tone could be considered pretty harsh there, uh, you know, because he's, 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 asked, he's telling them, you know, well, how, how quickly you're falling away from uh, the, 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 true, the true doctrine of Christianity and what have you. But the truth of the matter is, is that we have to be harder on ourselves than than anybody else because the the burden that's on our shoulders the burden to carry on uh, the, the the fight for uh, the fight against world government uh, the fight to restore America's national sovereignty basically for for all things that are good human liberty human dig- dignity demands that that highest standard and and so essentially that highest standard in order for the Minutemen to Remain a remain a a worthwhile endeavor and cause. That that standard has to be applied to them as well. And you know who has the most to lose from this viz is exactly. none other than Jim Gilchrist, who organized the Minutemen. Because Jim Gilchrist, his 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 uh, son-in-law is follow-on Mexican, and his grandson is half Mexican. So so you know he he, he like 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 this uh, racism. Being insinuated into a group that he that he started into a movement that he spearheaded can affect him in a very very bad way. Okay, we have a caller um, on the line, and we'll take it at that time. Uh, hello, caller. Hi, how's it going tonight? First, I'd like to thank you guys for showing up and uh, appearing on the Grassy Knoll. <laughs> so He's talking to you guys. <laughs> I I noticed that your arguments are very nuanced, and I recall a book that I read some time back by Thomas Chittam, Civil War II, and in that book he used demographics and uh, uh, various racial data that pointed out that the country, both north and the southeast and the southwest, uh, were going to probably divide along racial lines. Now, uh, do have you read that book? Have you? Yes, sir. Have you That's given actually, any thought to that? Actually. Thank you for bringing that book up. That book was published and put out in 1996, and there's something very curious and and a strange coincidence 
surrounding that book. Uh huh. Um, see, and and th- that book was written from a white perspective. Chittam, uh claims not to be a racist uh, or or a white supremacist of of any of any sort. And al- although it seems that he he uh, has something against non wasp populations in it and whatnot, and that same, very same year that he, now his book was put out from a white perspective uh-huh. and it was saying that civil war was an inevitability and that we might as well get used to the idea meanwhile on the other side that exact same year a book was put out called the coming race war in america a wake-up call by carl rowan now carl rowan was it was is um a former member of the trilateral commission and he worked for uh, the Lyndon Johnson administration, and he wrote the exact same uh, same ideas, except he put the uh, that that Chittam espoused in his book. Except he he put the whole thing in a black perspective because Carl Rowan is a black. Uh-huh. So you have this white uh, white saying that race war is inevitable, and then you have this black saying that race war is inevitable. And the, 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 and the language and the themes of the book are so closely matching one another, and they were put out the exact same year. And is this, this and would it be not be possible to uh, review the same data, being a black person or a white person, and come to similar conclusions based it's upon the tr- based upon the the data? Uh, I mean, truth basically has no def- uh, no need for a defense. Do, do, but do you not find it strange that simultaneously two different groups are being told that war with one another is an inevitability? It, no, not necessarily at all. It, I, uh, I, I don't... I, there are, are bright people in all of the, the groups that, that are shall we say, interested in this topic. And looking downrange, it would seem to me that with the same data sets, uh, you would come to fairly similar conclusions. It seems to us, our conclusion was, was that because these books came out in the same year, and they suggested the same thing just from a black perspective in one book and then from a white perspective in another book that a racial dialectic was being set up. And that's what, what, that's what was, was taking place here. See, because you've got to understand what the establishment fears the most. If you go back to the years of COINTELPRO, which was the mm-hmm. FBI's counterinsurgency project, uh, the basically uh, going against different groups that the establishment feared. There was a case called Hobson versus Wilson, and I really would encourage you, and I would encourage all of the listening audience to go out and look up this case and to look into its background. This, during this case, Hobson versus Wilson, it was found that the FBI was working under the, the uh, uh, with a certain objective in mind, and that was to prevent at all costs any kind of an alliance between blacks and whites, and that there could not be some kind of unified front against the establishment that was made up of of both blacks and whites, and all. And and so, what 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 do you have to do to to prevent that? You have to introduce divisive racial politics, tribal politics into the population and get a cultural milieu of, of tribalism, of neo-tribalism going and get people split up into different racialist enclaves and, and, and whatnot. And, and that's, what seems to ha- that's what seems to have been behind these two books, uh, Carl Rowan's book and Chittam's book being released in the exact same year in our estimation. And, and what has been behind several other uh, intense racial uh, kind of uh, standoffs that we have had in this nation in the past. So I, I would just I would encourage you to uh, go out and to look into Hobson versus Wilson, and and then to look back at Chittam's book and then to look at Rowan's book 
in that context? Well, uh, you know, it has been tested out previously in South Africa. We don't hear much about South Africa now because the uh, the uh, uh, black majority now is killing the white people in great big batches, particularly the the uh, farmers, both in South Africa and in uh, what was Rhodesia, and what has been uh, but who previously a a, a a profitable uh, agricultural exporting uh, uh, area has now been reduced to abject poverty, an incredible... Uh, yes, but okay, okay, but, but again, sir, who was in control there? If you look at the ANC's background, look at who was behind the founding of the ANC. The ANC was not founded by a black man. It was founded by a white Lithuanian member of the KGB named Joe Slovo. And if you also look at once a government was set up, which the ANC was a part of, the African National Congress, that that uh, Nelson Mandela would meet periodically with the Oppenheimer family, which is a white uh, elite family. So, so oh, absolutely. And in fact, uh, uh, the uh, the yes, yes, I I I agree with you there. And and I see what what they are doing, and that that was their, shall we say, test tube to uh, try out various uh, forms of schemes genocide. and plans. Right, and you know it worked. Caller, I'm going to ask you to make one last comment. Um, I, I don't want to be rude, but I also you know want to move on. So um, absolutely. Uh, thank and you for calling. Thank you. It's a very interesting program, and we listen to the Grassy Knoll uh, uh, every weekend, and and uh, the the host is just Get outstanding. Out of here, <laughs> thank you very much. Have a yeah, yeah. I pay him to do that, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, that uh, that voice should be familiar to, to Grassy Knoll listeners from a couple of years ago. Um, that's a road we perhaps don't want to go down. But on the other hand, um, he made his point. Uh, and do you want to address that before we go on, guys? Well, um, just basically that that again. Ultimately, the problem there. Okay, on one end you have the conspiratorial uh, element where the 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 uh, ruling class is promulgating these racial dialectics. But then then again, and bear in mind, and this is this is this was a point that was made by now deceased uh, researcher William Cooper. They could not have done it, they could not have gotten this far if there weren't something wrong to begin with. And if we allow racial identity pro politics to to basically basically people uh, uh, basically take over our thoughts and, and guide our decisions then these sort of manipulations will continue sure. so it, I mean and they'll elevate too yeah they'll, uh, they'll elevate and escalate and rem remember this this is all again this is all integral to not only not only to their plans for social and political control but this is part of their occult religion because their religion is evolutionary in, in character. It was, it was uh, disseminated on the popular level mm -hmm. in, in the contemporary times as Darwinism, but, but it, part of the evolutionary process that they believe man to be going through is a, is a conflict between the races. Let me, let me say this, and then I'll shut up about the whole issue <laughs> altogether, too, you know, uh, to the listening audience. Uh, if, uh, if, do you want uh, America to look like France has looked over the past eight days with nonstop violent ra uh, riots and all? Then go ahead, go ahead and continue hating black people and Chicanos, and uh, black people and Ch Ch Chicanos, you do vice versa with the whites. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, let, let, let's agree on one thing, and because I think we do, and that is yeah. undeniably, and you guys said it quite a few times toward the end of the article, and you named the foundations, and you're absolutely right. And in fact, in that um, uh, that clip that um, I played from um, uh, Kamu Kamban, right? Mm -hmm. He's actually right in a sense. I mean, because I, I looked at Lady Viz, and uh, when we heard this, and I'm saying, 
the white, yeah, they're white devils who are doing this. But you know what? They're not only doing it to blacks and Latinos, they're doing it to us. And you guys know the Rockefeller and the boys don't care about you. They don't care about me. They don't care about any white who's a useless feeder in their minds. So, That's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and I, uh, <clears throat> by the way, I got an email from a converted uh, Muslim, and you know, you, you go into, you know, he he laid out this stuff about how Christianity is false and all that. And I wrote back and I said, you know, listen, we'll never ever agree on what we believe in, and I don't think you guys will ever in your lifetime, and I certainly have in mine. Never ever seen two people with divergent spiritual views ever convince the other to their side. <laughs> So I just said no. to him, but you know what, what I said is, again, we have a hate situation with Islam. And I told him, I said, no, no, you guys are being used as the patsies. The West has right. always been in the Middle East since the time of the Templars going down to the behest of the Vatican. And you've never right. been left alone. I mean, I, again, I told him, no, I said, you do have radical Islamic uh, units because they, there's a certain nihilism saying we got nothing to live for. And they hate us. And I kind of understand why. But I mean, of course... You guys and your family and myself, I mean, we're not the problem, but we're going to pay the price. Um, the point being is that, again, uh, this situation is getting worse. They, and the powers that be, the foundations, you know, the satanic Luciferian Illuminati want this to happen. They want as much havoc as possible to create the order they say they can give you, which will be totalitarianism. I'm, I'm only looking at two sides of the question, guys, and that is one, I have no, I have no ought with anyone. I don't have ought with Latinos or, you know, blacks or anybody. But the thing is, again, if I see you pressing down, you know, my other thing is like, well, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to sit here and become red grease. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, there's the problem, and. You know, I, I'm really not arguing with you a lot. Like I said, I, I think you were a little hard on the minute, man, but I understand why. You know, yeah. and, and that's what we're talking about. And obviously, you, you know, you, you uh, scratch the nerve and people are reacting. That's good that we have a debate like this. Sure. Uh, but I, you're right. It's the powers on high, nasty, dirty, old, generational white men who are wanting to see every single kind of havoc um, unloose uh, upon this land. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, and understand also that we're not getting on here like some scumbag like Morris D saying basically no. shut down the Morris uh, the Minutemen. That's not the that's not the intent. That's no. not our intent at all. It's, what we want is basically for there to be periodic house clean. We want it to be kept on the on a grassroots level because it's only on the grassroots level that you can prevent subversion and all. And and I can understand that when you got a guy like Tom Tancredo backing you up that's that's there's a real temptation there to accept that kind of that kind of uh, okay. that kind of support because right. he's, he's a rep he's a he, he's a representative you know with a with a with a uh, with a sophisticated staff you know, and with uh, considerably a lot more money coming in but 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 trust me you can you can trust your friend Joe down the street that you've known all of your life since third grade and all who probably didn't even get a high school diploma, got a GED, and the only crowning uh, crowning achievement he has in life is that he's been a been a true blue employee of Kim Lawn and uh, for for the last twenty plus years. And all you can trust him a lot more than you can trust Tom Tancredo. Why? Because you've known him your whole entire life. You're close to him. You know. You, you there's there's a lot less expectation of closet skeletons getting dragged out and all and you can have more of an influence over him yeah. and all and, and and so you know we have to keep this thing grassroots and we have to screen our our ranks and separate the goats from the from the uh, sheep so to speak yeah and, and another thing if I if I may say this mm -hmm. this, this is a this is a good thing that, that you bring up I mean I know is that you, you want to show the flip side of the coin, which is very important because multiculturalism and political correctness are not, are, are, are not desirable either. They're just as undesirable as racism. And, and for those people out there who think the answer to racism is, is self-hatred of one's own race, that's not going to solve the problem either. But as you know, Paul brought up earlier the Institute for Historical Reviews, uh, Review, which is Kind of a kind of a, a, a neo-Nazi uh, Holocaust-denying organization, 
Well, it turns out that their uh, publishing arm carries books by none other than Noam Chomsky. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a veritable icon of the left. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and Noam Chomsky has, uh, is, surprise, surprise, a Jew. And, well, it turns out that Noam Chomsky has written virulently uh, hate-filled literature towards uh, the Jewish race, towards towards Israel, uh, uh, throughout his entire career, has uh, supported several Holocaust-denying so-called scholars. And, on top of that, Noam Chomsky also has, has referred to, to, to uh, uh, research regarding uh, 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 the Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission as absurd. He calls the uh, CFR and the Trilat, he calls them, quote-unquote, nothing organizations. Right. He also uh, uh, denies any and, and all proof or, or evidence uh, concerning uh, a, a, an assa- assassination conspiracy uh, surrounding JFK. So what does this tell us about about Chomsky? Well, Chomsky obviously is a, an agent of disinformation, but also he's he's what's known as Hofjuden, and that basically means a self Jew. Oh, right. Exactly. And and he cares. He 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 comes from a, a, a tradition which seems to run long throughout the uh, left wing uh, of 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 just self hatred towards uh, uh, self hatred uh, self hatred within the uh, within the Jewish race and the one another case in point is uh, Karl Marx who wrote the book uh, who what was himself uh, uh, a Jew and uh, uh, was of course a, a paid a paid agent to to uh, for the promulgation of communism mm-hmm. and, uh, wrote the communist manifesto which was based on illuminist ideas sure. but he also wrote a book called a world without Jews so uh, self hatred, <laughs> self hatred isn't the answer either. You know, the, we're we're the the the, the flip side. Uh, we we don't want to wind up on either side of these fences. We don't want to wind up on the you know race uh, racial supremacist uh, uh, racist side of the fence. We don't also want to wind up on the self hating uh, side of the fence. We don't want political correctness and multiculturalism. What we want here, though, basically is is just the common acknowledgement of mankind's the mankind's universal position of imago viva die or made in the image of the creator and since we're all created in the image of the creator we all are one human race and since we since everybody wants to talk about uh, 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 some sort of super race a master race then I think we all can agree that there is one master race, and that's the human race, mm-hmm. the, the the race that that the the, the Lord put here, uh, irrespective of collars, whatever. I don't care if you have you know antenna sticking up from your head, <laughs> and we all can agree <laughs> what the enemy is. All right. Well, look. Let me let me do this. Let me make a couple of announcements. I got one more email uh, for you that I want to uh, run by you. And if you don't mind, and uh, we can stay in this discussion, and if it's, if it's uh, uh, promulgated further by callers, that's fine. Other than that, I'd like to touch upon a couple of things, if we could, about your past works, um, if that's okay with you. Sure. sure. All right. Well, let me do this. Uh, if you want to jump in on the conversation, uh, you can do so by emailing at visigoth at hotmail.com. That's V-Y-Z-Y-G-O-T-H at hotmail.com. You can instant message through AOL at WDCF 1350, and you can call, uh, if you need to, uh, on 352-567-1009. And if you want to call in but you don't want to pay for it, then just shoot me an email for those whom I can identify as being basically friends of the show, and I'll send you a calling card, uh, phone number, and PIN, and you can call in on that. I'm really sorry that the 800 numbers are gone, and um, uh, you know that, I just feel like I have to do that. All right, I'm going to shoot this by you, and uh, if nobody continues this vein, we'll tie that up and go back to some of the other things you've done. Um, and remember, listen, l- let's face it. You've scratched the nerve on this, and that's okay. You're going to create a debate, and that's what we need. So, in other words, where I might have been 100% with you along everything, maybe in this case I'm not, but so what? You know, I mean, it, it needs to be talked about, and, and are, you, are you comfortable with that, guys? Sure, sure. Okay. Now get ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's, here's a, uh, an email. It says, uh, I wholly disagree with the Collinses that
that any desire to remain racially and socially separate is equivalent to racial, quote, supremacy, unquote. Or that the exercise of racial awareness by whites or the desire to live separate from other races is necessarily bad. And I know right away, you know, I, I, can, I can feel the hair going up in the back of your neck. He said, this is painting with much too broad a brush and is really thinly veiled anti-white doctrine. The pejorative use of the smear word social fragmentation seems to me to be an expression of their own personal uncomfortability with white people being white, remaining white, and wanting to live with their racial group. Uh, there's nothing inherently wrong with this, no matter what the colonists believe. And, that, you know, and that's, that's fine. So uh, if I can go back and pull something out of that, and that is the desire to remain socially and racially separate is equivalent to racial supremacy. Um, that's a tough one. How do you guys feel? The problem is, is that when you have that kind of a separatist kind of mindset, it's divisive. And, and it's interesting to find that separatism has been promulgated by elites. You, for instance, t uh, Tito, uh, the communist Tito, he used it you know, over in, uh, in, in Eastern Europe. And uh, the problem is, is that when, with separatism, uh, you, you have no social cohesion and all, and you just don't have any kind of cooperation uh, that, that is meaningful in any way between the, ver the various people in a country. So how can you even say that you even have a country? And all? I mean, it, it's, you, you basically got people split up into different enclaves, and those enclaves can be played off of one another and periodically made to go to war with one another, and and um, and also you 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 lack any kind of uh, any kind of strong kind of of a, of a national kind of glue, and all and, and what you what you'll have will eventually whatever country you have will eventually fall apart because the Confederacy was for this kind of a of, of a ridiculous idea. And, and they were for uh, splitting up in, in succession and whatnot. And many people don't know, don't understand what that would have basically have have led to. It would it would have it would have led to an end of the of the, of the United States and basically an end to the uh, American experiment into uh, the, the democratic uh, republicanism. And and so I mean I I just I find the idea. Of separatism in this day and age as as just as, as just ridiculous, and I also find it to be it, it, it's 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 a it's an idea that can be manipulated really really easy as long as the elites have some kind of division and all some kind of beef that we have with one another that they can play up they will play it up. Yeah, and also um, no, I'm not uncomfortable with being white. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got no, you got no choice, do you? Really? <laughs> yeah, didn't really have a choice in the matter anyway. So the way I see it is, hey, I, you know, I kind of like it, you know. So, hey, <laughs> I mean, and, and you know what, you know what, it, 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 I, I'm, I'm uh, it's not only, not only, I don't, I don't consider it an accident. I believe it, it's part of the way that the uh, Creator, that that the Lord, uh, makes us and, and makes His masterpieces. But you know what, <laughs> I think that Tyra Banks. Who is uh, who's black? I think that she's also equally a masterpiece. So you know, I mean, it, 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 <laughs> but I mean to, to say that you know, and again, I already addressed the issue mm -hmm. of of racial self hatred. It's not the solution. So no. um, I, you know, I'm sorry, buddy. But and uh, if it was an anti-white essay that we put together, why is it that in the no. latter part of the paper we go against Otswan and we show? How what uh, what Otswan believes is yeah. thoroughly fascist, oh, yeah. but, racist. Yeah, but guys, well, let me tell you, not letting anybody off the hook. <laughs> oh no, no, that believe. But you know, I have to tell you uh, truthfully, um, you did not write an anti-white thing, and I don't think uh, the email was thinking that either. Uh, yeah, I think you were pretty honest. I mean, I, I, like I said, for certain reasons, I thought you were a little tough in the minute, man. And um, but no, no, I mean, uh, no, um, I don't think for any way, shape, or form. That it was anti-white. But let me also say something to you, if you don't mind. And historically, I'll say this. When I look at the stars and bars, and I know it's supposedly offending people, uh, whether it's in a, you know, an upper left-hand quadrant of the Mississippi flag or whatever, the stars and bars to me mean one thing. And I can understand it means bigotry to others. I understand that. It's a symbol. That's all it is. But to me, honestly, you guys said, um, if the South had had its way, 
it might have been the end of the United States. Uh, and I would say that um, they didn't have their way, and it was the end of the United States only in this sense. Strictly from a, a political uh, aspect, I would say this. They understood what the radical Republicans in the North wanted, and basically what Europe wanted. And they wanted a huge centralized government, which I think you have to admit we have today. And the South said we wanted to have some sta states' rights and sovereignty and not have this expanded government, which the Founding Fathers, regardless if they were Christian or not, did not want. And when the South fell, uh, as it was supposed to, we got, and as, as Eric John Phelps would say, the 14th Amendment, Amer uh, United States of America. So all I'm saying is that I think the South realized uh, beyond the, the uh, slavery question, which I really do believe would have been ended, as it was in other countries, without bloodshed, um, it was not going to work. Uh, and we, I am not a proponent of slavery, believe me, even though we all are now, to the Federal Reserve. But what I'm saying is that uh, from a political standpoint, I think this, the, the, the South wanted to stick to what they thought was probably what the Constitution, or I mean the Articles of, uh, of uh, Confederation, wanted. And when they were dashed, that was the last hope of um, trying to keep the central government from expanding. Uh, you okay with that? What do you think? You're, what's your interpretation? Well, I think that the rank and file southerner probably felt that way, and I, be and I believe that Robert E. Lee felt that way, and his freeing of his slaves definitely shows that that was his sentiments. It, 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 he, when he freed his slaves, he shown he was basically saying that for him it wasn't even a slavery issue, but. Right. For the slave-holding elites in 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 uh, the Confederate states, and all, I believe that they basically wanted to have their own little personal slave systems, and uh, and basically have uh, they, they were going in the in the different direction uh, than the, than the Union was, where the where the Union was going to have this this very centralized, almost too powerful Leviathan and like uh, central government, they were going in the opposite direction where there was no government to speak of to keep the elites in line and to uh, police their actions. There was no, uh, there was no, uh, there wasn't a federal, there wouldn't be a federal government uh, strong enough to, uh, to protect the, the, the common person from, from uh, what these uh, slaveholding elites uh, wanted. And it should also be noted that that the uh, that the both the, both the North and the South were uh, funded and played off of one another by uh, the, the Rothschild dynasty. Oh, hey, listen, without a doubt, and um, I've said this enough times on the air, but I would just uh, ask you guys if, if you ever have a moment, and I know you're you know you're finishing up your degrees and stuff, so free time is not at a uh, is at a premium, but maybe some summer or something like that, you can read. Um, uh, and I'm not being condescending when I say this. But there are two books out there that give you a different look at the Civil War. And uh, they were suggested to me by a listener in Virginia, and I found them to be absolutely treasures. And that is The Lincoln Conspiracy by Gutteridge and The Dark Union by Neff. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry. The Lincoln Conspiracy by Balsinger. The Dark Union by Neff and Gutteridge, university professors out, I think, of University of Indiana where you find out what kind of wheeling and dealing was going on behind the scenes between the North and the South, um, and maybe some of the real issues that were at stake. Um, slavery, you know, I don't, I don't think that was an issue at all. That was the emotional thing that got people all fired up to go to war. But it's always economics, I think, anyway. And, of course, um, it will show you also a, uh, a link back to the Europe, European monarchies and the Vatican. I don't mean to be a one-note Johnny, but I'll tell you what. You know, I'm to the point now where I have to say, as many times as I have been told that it can't possibly be, and as I felt that way when I read Eric John Phelps and Charles Wilcox's works, but I'll tell you what, it's in the history. It's, it's documented. It's in, it's in newspapers. In other words, it, it's, it's hiding in plain sight. And as I said to Victor Thorne and Lisa Giuliani, I'm saying, listen, I'll, I'll tell you what. You don't have to go along with me on this one, but, I'll, I'll, but let me say this. What other institution has been at it for centuries? The Bilderbergers? I think not. 1953, right? Trilateralists? I think not. 1973. The CFR? 1921 with the Royal Institute of International Affairs. But the Vatican and the Jesuits have been around for centuries. And, well, I'm, I'm, you know, and my feeling is that it's a send down from them. And uh, go ahead, guys. Go, you know, run with it. 
Okay, well, we would probably definitely agree that there's a conspiratorial and definitely sim sinister element to the uh, whole uh, uh, Vatican thing. And uh, to, when you get in, off into that topic, you know, you, def you definitely go into groups like, like Opus Dei and the, 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 the Jesuits, mm -hmm. uh, Ignatius Loyola's uh, little group, and, and uh, different other uh, dark areas of, of the church, in, in particular the Borgia family, the Borgia family which, which ruled it over the church during the time of Luther, and, uh, and which was, uh, was credited by Mario Puzo. Many people probably in the audience don't know this, but the Borgia family, which, was, which set off a whole line of popes, uh, was was credited by uh, by Morio Puzo, uh, who wrote The Godfather, as being the family that started the mafia. Uh, so we 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 do acknowledge that there's a conspiratorial uh, the conspiratorial uh, um, faction there mm -hmm. and all. But our our feeling is is that the the establishment is not some monolithic, omniscient, all knowing. Uh, group, uh, it, it isn't, it, 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 it is, it doesn't have complete power by any stretch of the imagination. The establishment is a network that's based on the precepts of oligarchy and elitism, and it's a network which elites can work through to consolidate power and interface with other elites when the, when their objectives are the same. That being said, Elites disagree, and elites fight and feud with one another, and 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 there's there's factionalism there, mm -hmm. and all. We we and if there wasn't factionalism there, then Scooter Libby wouldn't have been indicted this last uh, week or so ago when he was indicted because because if it was a big monolithic all powerful thing, then the man would have been totally insulated from any attack whatsoever, and all. Uh, the, the, there's different elite dynasties mm -hmm. that have cooperated with one another at, at certain given points in history, and then at other history, at other points in history, have fought with one another. Uh, n new money and uh, is hated by old money. Old old line families hate the new line families because they see them as intrusive Johnny Come Latelys what? and all. So we we don't we don't see any any one group as being the center of the onion, so to speak, uh, mm -hmm. the command topology, the command topology to this whole thing uh, shifts. And, mm -hmm. and, and at one moment, one group will be weaker than another, and then at another moment, the, the other group will be the stronger. Well, let me say this, Steve, because you raise a great point, and, and little did you know, unwittingly, you're leading me in a segue into our second and final guest, uh, Dr. Ellen Lachter, who had, we've been emailing back and forth, we have never addressed this on air. But since you've said this, you've hit it right on the head. I would say, no, you guys are wrong, that there is one faction that sits over it all. And she said um, to me in emails, uh, there are competing NWO factions. And she's going to speak to that in this last hour. So I'm not shamelessly promoting the third hour. But uh, I'll tell you what, I, w I would go you know, hammer and tongue against you guys. And I'm saying, no, there might be a little spats. However, she's going to have her say... And, um, and I'm really interested in what she has to say. With regard to what's going on now, I'm going to say something to you, and I don't know how this is going to shake out. And you guys are too young, and I'm not pulling rank on you, to remember what happened in the Nixonian administration. But I'm going to just say, and I'm not, I, I, I won't go into it in depth now, but the way things are going, it's almost like they're taking the same script and running it over again. In other words, we have high oil prices, as we had in 73, okay? Gold is, is high, as we had in 73. We've got probably a more corrupt administration, as we had in 73. We've got heads rolling and, and people being offered up. But let's see where it really leads. Are we looking at um, the resignation of a president after the vice president gets thrown in the path and, uh, and told to leave office? You see where I'm going? I mean, it, it, and I'm like... I'm just throwing this latter part out, but can you see? I mean, would we really be facing a rerun? What do you think? I would, you'd have to get a resonating here, here, from with, with that because. Yeah. <laughs> well, well to, 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 to also, I'm, I'm paraphrasing uh, one of my favorite uh, researchers, uh, a guy by the name of Daniel Pausner. Um, um, factionalism aside, all the conspiracies and sub conspiracies that that comprise. Uh, 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 that, that that comprise this, 
just, you know, dense amalgam of Daniel Kautner say says that they essentially constitute a single conspiracy because while they while they do fight, while they do war with each other, they and the command topology shifts and mm-hmm. fluctuates, they nonetheless always continue to head towards the same goal together. So uh, you know, it, it's it's like it's like uh, you know, it's like we're all putting we're all deciding what's going to go on our subway uh, our subway sandwich. We just can't you know agree on if it's going to be lettuce or if it's going to be the banana peppers. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. so, <laughs> I mean that's a rather crude analogy, but uh, yeah. So uh, but we all want the sandwich, and that's what they want. They they want the sandwich, but uh, they just can't agree on the condiment. <laughs> That was a really bad analogy. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You're making me hungry by the moment. But uh, no, it's a good one. And I just want to tell folks also, um, good old Terry at conspiracyarchive.com. Great guy. Great guy. Yes, he is. God bless him. Uh, he's been on the show, and he does a really great job. Um, and I'm looking at the page right now, if you'll let me, because we're never going to touch upon these topics, and yet they're very salient uh, to our time. And yet you guys have also done works that refer back in antiquity of where a lot of this uh, comes out of. And we spoke about it in that 10-part series. Um, but, I mean, just looking at your latest titles, if I can throw them out, and what I'm going to ask people to do is you can go to conspiracyarchive.com. That link is off visigot.com if you just want to go there. But whether or not you go there, you've got to go to commentary, and then you'll find the Collins uh, articles. And you've done stuff um, about Katrina and the Politics of Disaster, and uh, you also did something which we've had a person come on. I don't know if you've heard her. I- I'm going to have her back on. But you talk about legal land theft? And yep, that's my article. Uh, Holy mackerel. Paul Collins, uh, legal land theft in the uh, Supreme Court. Well, I tell you what, again, I'm shamelessly promoting the show. But this woman came on from uh, the suburbs of Atlanta. And, I mean, we have, we have her for an hour uh, in, in the archives. But you should hear about how if they want your land, they'll just take it. Yeah. And, and the fight that she had with the courts, I mean, it is chilling. So, I mean, again, you hit a topic that is very, very important today. I'm sure you wrote it in back of that eminent domain decision. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but, but I do go back into a little bit of history of, of, the, of the oligarch's tradition of taking land from people. I go into how uh, the common land was taken away from people uh, in England. I go into how uh, how the Indians, uh, the Native Americans here in America, lost their land to uh, to the government, which was prostituted out at that time by to the privately owned uh, railroad companies, and, and later on how they their lands were abused by the government, which was then prostituted out to the oil companies and uh i I go into some of the background and and just just how they are these elites are preoccupied with 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 stealing land from people because they don't know how to get it through honest honest means but would you not agree that that the central thing to the united states i think again that was different from the monarchies of europe and that was common people were actually allowed to buy land that's right you're absolutely correct and that's the incentive for working in the first place if you don't if you're not allowed to keep that which you produce, then you have absolutely no incentive to be productive in any in any sense. And the war waged by Marxism was the war waged not against a ruling class, but against the property class. People like you and me who own and have the right to own our own homes and our own possessions. And that's precisely what communism, what Marxism, whether disseminated on the popular level as fascism or communism, was designed to do was squeeze people like you and I out of existence. Well, I think you can agree that right now everything that's taking place is um, probably um, adversely directed toward property owners. Uh, down here in Florida, I got to tell you, I didn't think about this five years ago, but with all these deed restricted communities, and really that's your only choice unless you really want to go out in the hinterland and buy an acre or two. And that is especially in a deed restricted community you don't really own anything i mean you don't have any say over your land you can't do this you can't do that and I, i'll tell you guys i lived in this situation i got out of it because i couldn't take it ironically i came back as a renter but you know what i feel so much be- better as a renter 
because, you know, I didn't own it to begin with anyway when I was here. And I, I'm looking for the day when I can go out and get a couple of acres and just be left alone. Ha, ha, ha. That, you know, and in the coming times, I don't know how uh, possible that's going to be. Yeah. Well, I, I also think that uh, the whole scam that the oil companies are playing on people right now are going to play into the whole property thing because I think that people are going to literally have to walk away from what they own because they're not going to be able to heat it. They're not going to be able to keep it go keep it up because uh, gas prices are just getting too high. Um, I mean, the, the gas companies this year made historic profits. Exxon mm -hmm. alone had 75% increase in their profits. And, the, and so there's been murmuring of a congressional investigation which really needs to take place. And, and, all, and, and, and so, you know, they play into, uh, into uh, destroying property rights uh, too. And, and this winter could could really uh, could really seal the fate of a lot of property owners because they'll just say, "Look, I'm I'm freezing. It's as cold as hell, and and I cannot, you know, I cannot pay what it takes to keep this place heated up." And, you know, it's, it's sad to say. Yeah, well, I, I tell you, we're going to see as has been foretold. Um, we're going to see um, a, a messing with um, obviously uh, oil, and then energy, and water, oh, yeah. and food, and that's you know what's going to come um uh paul pilgrim you can fade in the music and we're going to transition uh paul and philip collins thanks so much for coming on it was it was spirited it had much more of an edge than we ever had but that's okay i think that's good and i'm glad you came on and i appreciate the time that you spent with us well we appreciate you for having us man. no problem we're going to do it again and um and i'm glad that you know you have um a very good avenue also with michael corbin who's a really good guy oh yeah <laughs> All right, listen, best of you all, and we'll catch you on the other side. Okay, God bless. All right, good night now. Night.